So I started working with people who were uh, described as mentally disordered offenders. So kind of in that niche between criminal justice system and also the mental health system. Well, I worked predominantly with, with sex offenders mm. and I worked with sex offenders who had uh, mental health problems which may or may not have been related to their offending. But I have worked with people in the community who have done things and I cannot fathom why they are in the community. All I can say is that it's my job to manage them. And, you know, the trick is always to be very, very cynical and, and keep an eye out for what could go wrong to make sure that it doesn't go wrong. So people can be managed. Whether they should be is a different question. He is somebody who, as an adult, impersonates being a, a 15 or 16 year old child. And he's done this continuously in order to go and live in a, you know, a foster home or in an orphanage. He actually pretended to be a missing boy from Texas. The boy that he impersonated had blue eyes. Frederick Bourdain has got brown eyes. And yet the family of this missing boy took him in. These are not the same boys. You know, it's clear that these are not the same boys. How can this be? And his family refused to have um, DNA tests done. Frederick Bourdain now says that uh, the reason for that is that they had killed their son. And so they knew that he was an imposter all along. And he was actually telling me, I can still get away with this. I can still, I can still pretend to be a you know, a 14, 15, 16 year old boy. I said, are your days of being a con artist over? And he couldn't tell me that they were. It turns out that I was being stalked from about 2009. I just wasn't aware of it. And I got a message on Facebook saying, hey, I've set up these websites in your name. So I've bought kerrydanes.com, kerrydanes.co.uk. And he was commenting about clothes that I was wearing. How does he know what, what I'm wearing? He's, he's seeing me in my day-to-day -day life. I had never seen this man. So I was getting really quite paranoid, wondering who this guy was. You know, I'm in the, I'm in the post office. I, I don't know. I don't know who he is. I don't know whether he's behind me. Somebody tried to run me over when I was walking with my dogs. And he actually um, parked in, in, a, in a club that is at the bottom of my road. So he parked in an empty car park and he stayed there. And when I walked into the car park and I realised, actually, hang on a minute, we're alone. Mm. And I thought, no, I need to get out of here. He drove out very, very slowly. And then I found my cat dead. <sighs> yes, and I don't know how the cat died. All I can tell you is that the cat had been thrown over the fence and somebody had written Jill Dando on the fence. Right. Yeah. Okay. So here we are in the first interview in the new Liverpool studio. Mm -hmm. I hope you like it. I hope also that you like Carrie Danes' dog. <laughs> hello, hello. So... Kerry was one of the headliners at CrimeCon. You may have seen her on the live streams that we do. We had a brief interview, but we are going to get into far more detail today. We were listening to Kerry's audiobooks on the drive up here, and she is a forensic psychologist, right? That's your right. job title? What was your job yeah, title? Yeah, well, my job title is like really, really <laughs> long, but forensic psychologist, that does it. Okay. That says it. Do you want to tell the viewers the names of your books as well? Yes, they are What Lies Buried, and they are true stories of madness, the bad, and the misunderstood. Nothing to do with pathology, I should point out. Everybody thinks that I'm a pathologist. There are things that lie buried in the book, but it's mainly to do with what lies buried in people's psyche. Yeah. And the first book that I wrote was called The Dark Side of the Mind. Right. And have you been doing a lot on TV? Yeah, I do quite a lot on TV. And I do a programme on Discovery and Discovery Plus called Faking It. 
Thank tears you. of a crime. Yeah, it's all about um, police interviews, really. It's analysing police interviews, but applying a model of lie detection to them. So it's all about spotting those tells that somebody might not be sticking entirely to the truth. So the people are getting interrogated then. You're looking at their body language, is it? We look at their body language. We've got a specialist um, body language expert, Cliff Lansley. We took about what they say and the minute of what they say with a linguistic expert who is Professor Dawn Archer. So she is, you know, she's she's got qualifications coming out of her ears. And then there's little old me and I am the general broad, <laughs> broad brush, if you like. So I'm the overview. Is this on Discovery now then? Can people watch it? Yes, you can stream. Can I do a quick plug then? Please yeah, do. Straight to the camera. You can stream series five of Faking It, Tears of a Crime on Discovery Plus now. And you can also watch it on Quest Red on Saturday nights. And all of Kerry's links will be in the description box below this video if you want to check out her work, buy her books, or follow her on her socials. And she was a smash hit at CrimeCon. Um, things that she's told us, there's lots more coming, but I'm not going to let anything slip. CrimeCon was such a blast, it really Wasn't was. Wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I was exhausted at the end of it, but it was such fun. Yeah, definitely. Good, good connections were made. Yeah. All right, so for the people who are not familiar with your story then, Kerry... What made you want to get involved in criminal justice and working in institutions? I kind of got into it by mistake because I wanted to go into advertising. So I fancied myself as a marketing executive because I was motivated by money and I saw pound signs. <laughs> but when I was at university, all the good-looking boys were in the law subsidiary classes. <laughs> so I started taking law. And that was specifically because there was a boy that I really, really wanted to talk to who was taking that class. And actually, I never looked up the courage to talk to him. I just gazed at the back of his head. But a beautiful relationship was formed anyway because I got really interested in the law. Right. So I thought, well, how can I marry law and psychology together? And the obvious answer was forensic psychology. Now, this was back in the early 90s. So we just had Cracker on TV. Cracker? Yeah. I've never heard of it. You've never heard of Cracker? No. So when I got, when I got um, deported from America, my parents showed me Cracker. That was in like 2007, 2008. What's that programme based on? It's like a detective, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a forensic psychologist who works with the police. And this guy is all but psychic, basically. So he tramples all <laughs> over crime scenes, yeah, in his shoes. Of course, he's an alcoholic. Yeah. He's played by Robbie Coltrane. Got all kinds of personal problems. So it's this kind of tortured genius trope that you see all of the time. And uh, he can he can tell practically what colour underwear somebody is wearing <laughs> from his analysis of the crime scene. So it was absolutely huge in the early 90s. And everyone says, were you, were you influenced by Cracker? And I think that's how I knew about forensic psychology. But I'd never watched an episode of Cracker. Right. So no is the answer to that. <laughs> Not your inspo. Yeah. <laughs> so what did you gain from law? I think just an understanding of how the law works. And it can be really interesting. And also how the law doesn't work. And I wanted to, to kind of blend the two together. And at that time, I suppose I had more of a almost morbid curiosity because I was young. Mm. I was young. And I think if you go into forensics, then you've got to have an interest in the darker side of life, haven't you? And I used to watch Tales of the Unexpected. Do you remember yes. that? I'm totally showing my age here. <laughs> so I was, I was interested in people who did strange things and trying to figure out why. Uh, and then that became more of an academic interest. It became less, less lurid. But I've always remained curious. But then it just got very interesting in how it all interacts. So I started working with people who were uh, described as mentally disordered offenders. So kind of in that niche between criminal justice system and also the mental health system. So what were your university years like? My were you a partier? <laughs> yeah, of course I was. Of course I was. I had a good time at university. You know, I always say that if I had realised that those years just really don't last forever. Ooh, I would have yeah. had a lot more sex and taken a lot more drugs, basically. 
<laughs> so I had, I had my time at university, but now I'm a fine, upstanding citizen. <laughs> yeah, but of course, of course I did. So did you set your sights on then an entry-level position somewhere at the end of uni? Yes, I set my sights on that way before, really, because it's so difficult to get into forensic psychology. It's like the Hunger Games. It's really? really, it's incredibly popular and it's really competitive. So usually you go in as a psychology assistant, but to get that psychology assistant post, your CV has got to look better than everybody else's and that's really difficult. So the first year that I was in university, I took myself down to, I was at university in Sheffield. So I went down to the Sheffield Volunteer Bureau and said, what have you got for me? What, what volunteer job can I do that's somehow related to law? Mm. And I was put on a scheme that at that time was run by Bernardo's. And it was the appropriate adult scheme. So I was sitting in on police interviews with people who had mental health problems or who were vulnerable, maybe because they were young or they had a learning disability. So I'd literally be dragged out of bed at three o'clock in the morning because, you know, there's a police interview here and we need an appropriate adult. I mean, I was barely an appropriate adult <laughs> myself, quite frankly, you know, I was 19 years old. So, but it was interesting and I got really interested in the way that the police work and the way that they um, interview people because the law had just changed because we'd had so many um, high profile cases involving false confessions, the whole model of police interviewing had changed in the UK. So we now use the peace model. I don't know whether you're aware of that. No. It's very non, as, as the title would suggest, it's very non-confrontational. And it's not about dragging a confession out of somebody. But they used to. It's a, yeah, it, yeah, you can't take somebody around the back and whack them around the head with the Glasgow Herald anymore. That just doesn't happen. You can't beat a confession out of somebody. So, um, you know, I, I got interested in, in all of that kind of thing and started to look at how different places do it. Places like America, yeah, where their interrogation really is an interrogation and it is all about pulling a confession out of somebody. So it was, it was, really, good, um, it was a really good grounding and I think that it gave me that little bit of an edge. But then... When I left university, I realised that I wasn't going to go straight into that psychology assistant post, even with all of these extra bits and pieces that I'd done. So I volunteered again, uh, had my £36 a week income support. I'd gone on an employment training scheme yeah, known as ET. It was also known as ET because you got an extra tenner on your benefits if you, went, if you went on it. And I got myself a flat above a dingy Chinese takeaway <laughs> in Wakefield. And I went to work voluntarily at Wakefield Prison. A.K.A. Monster Mansion. A.K.A. Monster Mansion. All right, well, going before Wakefield, then, going back to these, like, three o'clock in the morning calls. Yeah. Watching these interviews for the first time, what was going through your head? Um, a lot of it was pretty tedious, but what was going through my head was, does the person understand what is being asked of them? Is this all above board? Is this all legal? Is, you know, does this person need a cigarette break? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's very much my role as an appropriate adult was to make sure that the rights of the person being interviewed were not being violated in any kind of way. So I don't know whether that's probably where my uh, focus on, um, you know, on, on the, the suspect yeah. comes from. How, of, how often do you have to assert your rights during that time? Uh, at that point, f fairly regularly, because it was a new system. Yeah, so I was at university in 1992, and literally the peace model had just been introduced in 1992. Would you so be able to explain the peace model? Yeah, so the peace model... Oh, God, this is going to be a test now. So it's, <laughs> um, it's an acronym, and basically it's for the different stages of a police investigation. So the P is preparation, the E is engagement... Uh, and also then we have A for account. So we get the, get the person's account of what happened. So there's no interference with it. You know, there's no dragging it out of them. It's just what happened, getting the details. And then the C is for clarify. 
yeah? Mm -hmm. And then the E, I think, is for um, endings. But, I mean, obviously, that is a very simplistic way of looking at it. There are, there are more sub-stages within that. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that you get somebody's account and then you clarify it, you present what information you've got and what evidence you've got and say, well, hang on a minute, that doesn't necessarily correspond with what you've said, or maybe it does, I don't know. And so you you challenge them in that kind of way, but you don't do as they do in America and say, well, uh, you've failed a lie detector test, whether they have or not, and uh, you know we've got all of this other evidence against you. And by the way, your friend Bert says that he saw it and you know he did it. We're not allowed to lie to suspects, so you know there's none of the read techniques. I was going to say how does this the compare to the read? Yeah. And Brendan Dassey's case. Exactly. So th I find that kind of thing absolutely fascinating. And I find it really fascinating that these techniques that we know result in false confessions, particularly with people who are stressed, you know, <laughs> most people are pretty stressed when they're yeah. being dragged into a police station. Yeah, or, or particularly vulnerable, you know, low IQ or have, have other issues going on in their lives. You know, we know that they result in false confessions. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I kind of, I'm strange really because I'm, I'm very much into social justice and I've got one foot in the camp of the person who is accused, the offenders who I work with and yet I'm also very victim focused and I'm very lucky that actually I've managed throughout my career to not piss off either of those <laughs> two groups, you know, I managed that, I managed to balance it pretty pretty well but I'm I'm concerned about social justice doing things right and getting the right result because if you've got a false confession yeah then there's a perpetrator out there mm. so I think that we all we all you know we, we owe it to victims don't we and and suspects alike the, to get the truth most definitely and you see all the exonerations that have come about because of DNA evidence in America yeah it makes mm. you think you know there was, the killer was still out there I know it's just potentially killing more yeah. So. yeah 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 people who have spent years and years in prison wow yeah some of like 30 40 years now haven't they some of them yeah, yeah, I know. I think there's there's so much that needs to be tackled, really, mm. particularly in America. But I've got my work cut out with uh, all of the things that are wrong with the system in the UK before I get to America. Mm. I spoke to a guy in America, a, a guy who uh, helps the exonerees in America, and they'd all served like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. He took them out to a dance. Mm. And then when they all go up on the dance floor, they all started dancing in the way the dance was popular when they'd been arrested. Oh, the old bogey, like, so like, the 80s, the, yeah. some are doing the <laughs> twist. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, all right, so going into, into Monster Mansion then, first day, what was that like? Well, I was excited. I was you really excited. excited. Oh, of course I was excited. Because this was, you know, this is the beginning of this career that I, I really wanted. So, and actually, that's just reminded me. So it was June 1996 and the Spice Girls wannabe was number one. I remember that. Oh, I remember Spice that. Girls. Yeah. And I really, really wanted to be a forensic psychologist. And it was like, here, here I am. You know, this, is, this is my opportunity. <laughs> Completely naive. And of course, I did the, the induction at Wakefield Prison, where it was hammered into me, this message that it's them and us, it's them and us. Never forget that. It's them and us. Um, and you've got the inmates who are terrible, awful, evil monsters. Mm. And then you've got the men in the black and white uniforms who are the good guys. You know, and it's very simplistic, isn't it? So you've got the good guys and the bad guys. And there's nothing in between. And I think that that is genuinely what I believed. It is genuinely what I believed at that time. Because that's, that's what we're, we're brought up with, isn't it? You know, we have the good guys and the bad guys in every TV show that you, that you ever watch. And in actual fact, the problems that I had in Wakefield Prison did not come from the inmates at all. And you talk about my first day. On my first day in Wakefield Prison, the prison uh, guards started running a book on who was going to have sex with me. Really? Yes. Yeah. So, um, and the first prison officer to ask me out on a date was a guy called John Hall, who, A, was married... <laughs> I was very naive, so I didn't actually spot the the wedding ring. But he, yeah, he'd been he'd been married for not that long, 
but B was ooh, absolutely not my type. So thankfully, it was a no to that request. But a few years later, I saw him on TV on his way home from work, still in his prison officer uniform and using his warrant card. He was enticing girls as young as 12 into 12. his car. Wow. No. Yeah. And he was convicted of a number of rapes and um, sexual assaults, not only of these girls that he'd abducted, but also colleagues <gasps> at the prison. Disgusting. Oh Female colleagues and women that he'd, he'd met on, on nights out. And he hit one woman so so forcefully whilst he was raping her that he actually broke her jaw. No. Yeah. So this kind of idea oh, of, well, there shit. are, you know, yeah. good guys Predator. and bad guys. Yeah, good guys mm. and bad guys. That blew that out of the water. I always say there's no them and us, it's just us. And actually, as soon as we realise that crime does not happen in a vacuum, it happens in our society, in our communities. And the people that commit it aren't walking around, you know, looking vastly different to the rest of us. Mm then the sooner we can start to solve those problems. But I, I thought about that recently, obviously, with the Sarah Everard case. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, what are your thoughts on that case, then? On the Wayne Cousins. Well, I mean, what, I, I understand the devastation of, of police officers who now have to struggle with the, the lack of trust that women have in them. But, it you know, they they are the best of us in some respects, but they can also be the worst of us because this is it. They are they are us. I think the, the police force has to look at misogyny within its ranks as a matter of urgency because there are real, real problems in the way that, um, you know, women's complaints of, of sexual assault, uh, domestic violence, you name it, stalking, are actually investigated. So lots of work to do there. But, uh, yeah, it just made me think... Well, it just made me think about you know that whole that whole thing that actually there that there are no monsters. There are just men, and actually, and women sometimes. And mm. it's 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 that that's almost more terrifying, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but it's just hard for people to accept. One of the things we're campaigning for on this channel is to end the war on drugs. Take all those resources and go after predators, investigate predators. Crimes against women or kids should be a top priority of the police. It but it be. seems that these guys don't get long enough, even when they do get investigated, or for sexual assaults. Hardly any of them get convicted. Oh, I mean, the conviction rate for rape is just, it's, it's ridiculous. It's something like 0.3% actually oh when you boil God. it down to it that will result in a guilty conviction. Wow. So, and a lot of women's groups have said, well, effectively, rape has, has become, you know, decriminalised. Wow. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you can get away with it. You can yeah. get away with it. And, and certainly, I, I know what you're saying. A lot, of, a lot of resources that are used for other things could maybe be diverted. Yeah. I mean, the most dealt drug in the world is weed. Mm. Mm. So the most police time is involved with these gangs that are primarily dealing weed. Even America has legalised and decriminalised. And the police have saved so much money. And they're putting the money into schools, the taxes, and they're putting the money into schools and educating the kids. It's like, I get frustrated with it. Anyway, what, what, go on. Well, I get frustrated, I get frustrated with the number of women that are killed. I mean, three, three a week. Three a week. Yeah, or is it one every three days? Sorry, oh is it one God. every okay. three days? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, and the number of, of sexual abuse cases that aren't prosecuted... Uh, the number of rape cases that aren't prosecuted and domestic violence, stalking, you name it. There is, it's just a tidal wave, really, of violence against women that gets brushed under the carpet. And mm. I get really frustrated with that. What does that say about a society that the justice system does not prioritise women and kids? That's completely wrong. They should be at the top. Yes. Yeah, they, they, they should be at the top. They should be at the top. But then you've got to look about who, who, is, who is the criminal justice system mm. and who are the people who are running it. And largely, they are men. And mm. I don't think that it is necessarily a priority They're for They're making them. a lot of money warehousing people. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it's kind of frightening because you think, well, if all of these cases were dealt with, what the hell are we going to do? Mm. Yeah, with, with all of the people that would actually then, there'd be an influx <laughs> of guys into prison. 
Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that I think is probably pretty terrifying for the people at the top as well, because, you know, if we identify these mm. people and start to proactively do something about them, mm. whether it's management or locking them up or whatever, rehabilitation, yeah. then that's going to cost a huge amount of money and it's going to leave us with some significant problems. Well, yeah. you have some views, don't you, about what should happen to them? Oh, yeah, I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that view in a minute. Well, let me just say something else then. <laughs> so when I was in court um, getting my bail and the judge read out, read out my charges, which ecstasy trafficking bail bond was 750000 and all that, and um, the people started to speak to me, you know, all the people in the court, the prisoners and all the new arrestees were speaking to me. Mm -hmm. And it was all low-level drug use. I mean, they, they, were, they were shocked to hear someone that had been trafficking drugs because they were all low-level drug users, mentally ill, soldiers who come back from wars, PTSD, didn't get any help, street medicating on drugs. If you refer all those people over to the health system, you would have spaces for the predators in, in the prison system? Well, I personally don't think that um, prison sentences of less than six months mm. should, should be used mm. because... The majority of people go in for six months. What can be achieved in six months? Well, you can learn more about crime in six months. Yeah. Yeah, and you can uh, fail to address any kind of, as you say, mental health problem or addiction problem in six months. But you can also lose your job, you know, lose significant members of your family. It's just counterproductive. It's just that whenever you start to talk about these measures, people say, oh, you're being soft on crime. You know, you're, you're one of these, uh, so what, do, what did I get called? Uh, one, of, uh, one of my book reviews called me um, a lefty narcissist, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of like, can, I don't know, they don't, don't seem to fit together, do they? And she swallowed the book of woke. Well, I haven't, because actually I'm known for being really harsh. In <laughs> this leads to my next question, and the yeah. Jews aren't going to think we're soft on crime when we discuss this. Chemical castration for predators? Oh, so we had uh, this discussion no. on the way up. No. Okay. <laughs> no. I'm going to say no because it simply doesn't work because it's not about sexual arousal. Mm. And what somebody can't perform with their penis, they may well perform with a knife. And I've seen An that. Object. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Or okay. some other object because it's about power and control and dominance. So it can be useful for people who are very, very preoccupied and obsessed with sexual matters, but they are a minority, really. So what would you suggest? What, for sexual, sexual predators? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's so difficult because the government in the UK spent millions, and I mean millions of pounds of taxpayers' money on the sex offender treatment programme. It was their flagship offending behaviour programme in, uh, in the prison service and also in the probation service, in places like Wakefield Prison. And it was a um, cognitive behavioural program group program for sex offenders of all types so you could be in a group as somebody who is offended against a child you could be in that same group as somebody who's offended against an adult woman it might be rape it might be rape murder it might be sexual assault so a real mixture yeah so you can imagine what these groups became and it was discovered that they were not having any effect in making these men, because they were all men, yeah, um, less dangerous. In fact, the opposite was true. There was a very small effect size, but nevertheless, a significant effect size that showed that they became more dangerous if they took... Were they took sharing part. information about their crimes? Well, I think various things were happening. So they were sharing information about their crimes because at one point you have to sit, and it's called the hot seat... And you have to talk about your crime in very explicit detail. And then the other members of the group challenge you. And they are assessed on how well they challenge you. So, you know, so it's, it's in it for them to, 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 to be seen, at least, to say the right things. While gleaning. Yeah. But what I would find is that people were saying, well, now I'm thinking about sex even more often and now I've incorporated on. what somebody else has done into my sexual fantasies. So you can, you can imagine, can't you? I mean, you'd, you'd hear things that... I mean, I've, I've heard things running these groups that, seriously, I'd never 
never knew existed. Sexual practices I never knew existed. So, and also others who maybe had been victims of sexual abuse at some point in their histories would find it incredibly traumatizing. So they're listening to somebody describe in great detail how they've raped and murdered a child, yeah? So they would then come away with trauma issues. Traumatizing somebody doesn't make anybody less dangerous. No. Yeah. And most of them would go in and do you know what? They'd say the right things. They'd challenge people in the right ways. They'd, they'd express the right words. And then as soon as it's over and as soon as they're back, you know, in their, in their environment, whether that's the environment of the prison, which is incredibly macho, yeah? And it's very much survival of the fittest and it's incredibly misogynistic or whether it's just back into, you know, their friendship group or whatever. Any attitude, yeah, is just going to it's going to change right back, isn't it? So it's a pointless exercise. So we don't really know what to do with sex offenders. For me, I think it's about hearing people's individual stories. And I don't think there's a one size fits all approach. So having these these programs where everybody goes and does a group program and you know f follows it like a kind of prescripted course is useful. Different people need different things. Mm. And sexual offenders are a, a really I'm gonna use a, a psychology term here. They're a heterogeneous group. What I mean by that is they're all different. Mm. And because they're all different, they're going to have different needs and maybe a different treatment approach. So what I've always tried to do is to work with people one-to-one. -one. But unfortunately, that takes a lot of resources, doesn't it? A huge amount of resources, which we haven't got. And, you know, a huge amount of time. And it relies on the person doing that treatment actually knowing their stuff. Mm. knowing their stuff and being skilled and so I think until we start to invest in staff then we're you know we're not going to get very far but you know often and even with serial killers what it's all about is having people in the community that you know in involve them keep an eye out over them and make them accountable early on yeah and I think some of the best things that I've seen are schemes like circles and circles is um it's circles of support and accountability and it works with sex offenders who have maybe done their term they're out in the community and of course everybody will eschew a sex offender nobody wants anything to do with a sex offender so what they do is they actually form a circle of support around them so they've got people in their lives but they'll say is to it them, like hang on a minute AA? you know when, you know when you go to an AA meeting i can visualize it and they're all sat around on chairs oh, it's and not, they all it's not meet literally up. a circle but oh, it, right. you know there's people so that, they have maybe a sponsor well, yeah, people, volunteers that come into this person's life, you know, yeah. will spend time doing stuff with them so they're not, they're not isolated, but equally are going to be saying to them, hang on a minute, there were two routes that you could have taken to the supermarket. One of them was past to school. Why have you done that? Mm. Yeah, so it's actually putting the, the onus on that person to be responsible and accountable. So people who know what they are capable of, that, you know, it, it, it's it's that it's that balance, isn't it, of actually compassion and support, which people think of as the soft approach, and accountability. It's it's when you get that kind of working together, I think that you start to make make progress. Mm. Yeah, you're gearing it to the specific needs and histories. Yeah. So you said st it's stories that matter, and the story that affected me the most out of all of the podcasts I've done is a woman called Maya. It's pure evil dad, if the viewers want to watch it on the True Crime Podcast playlist. So Maya's dad read her to do those things to her, kept a diary, rated what he'd done, put what drugs he'd used on her in the diary. I mean, the cop who found this diary was reading it and threw up when he mm. read this diary. So he gets arrested, and he knows he's only get, going to get so many years, the dad, he writes a letter to the judge mocking the whole process because he knows the judge can only give him so many years. And the judge said, you're the most evil man who's ever been in my courtroom. But, but I know I can only give you this, this amount of time. Yeah, I mean, there, there's been so much discussion over the release of Colin Pitchfork, hasn't there, recently? What's his, what's his well, case? Yeah. So Colin Pitchfork was one of the first uh, people ever to be... Um, 
tried successfully on DNA evidence in the UK and he had raped and murdered two 15-year-old girls. So two separate, separate incidents. And he was not given a full life sentence, a whole life sentence. He was given a term of, I think it was around 30, maybe 33 years. And he, he did that term. And actually, according to all reports, and I don't know because I've not met him, he, you know, did very well, did everything that was asked of him and expressed remorse, et cetera, et cetera. Had been work, you know, working his way um, back into the community via open release um, conditions, open prison conditions. And he was ultimately released, you know, about a month or two ago. And people were saying, well, you know, should this be the case? And I feel that, well, if you've, you've done your term, you've done your term. The problem there is that he was not given a whole life sentence. If I had been the judge, I would say, well, I'm sorry, yeah, that's a whole life sentence as far as I'm concerned, because some things are just too much of an assault, aren't they, on all of us, not just the girls and, and their family. I mean, you know, it's kind of like an act of terror, terrorism, isn't it? Yes. Um, but I have worked with people in the community who have done things, and I cannot fathom why they are in the community. All I can say is that it's my job to manage them, and we have managed them, and they've been safe. So it can, it can be done. And, you know, the trick is always to be very, very cynical and, and keep an eye out for what could go wrong to make sure that it doesn't go wrong. And people are recalled into prison should, you know, should there be any concerns about their behaviour. So people can be managed. Whether they should be is a different question. Mm. So what was the situation with your food then when you started at Wakefield? Was the situation with my food? Food. Yeah, you had an interesting <laughs> encounter. Ah, oh, I know what you're asking me about. Okay, well, it wasn't at Wakefield. It was actually oh, sorry. I had I'd moved at that point, so I was working in medium secure services, so forensic hospital services, and there was a particular annex to where I worked, which was well, it was termed a rehab ward, but actually. It was populated by three or four men who were probably never going to be rehabilitated and would probably just be leaving, you know, to go to a, a nursing home or something at some point. And one of those men was an 80 year old called Maurice. Mm. And Maurice was, you know, he's very old, as I say, very arthritic, so quite hunched over. And he had a prosthetic eye. So. I used to go there on Tuesdays and Thursdays and I would have lunch with the nursing staff there and also these, these guys. But I hadn't been warned about Maurice. Now, Maurice had actually um, killed two women. He started out as uh, an exhibitionist. He liked like a flasher in the park. A, yeah, that kind of thing. Mm. And, you know, we all laugh at the flasher in the park, don't we? It's a bit of a joke <laughs> for, you know, the, the, the guy in the, in the grubby rain mac. But <laughs> this is what it can escalate to. He liked to see fear and shock on women's faces. So it was a shock factor. It was the shock factor. And right. he'd, he'd been diagnosed with... Um, sadistic uh, personality disorder. So he, it, it, was, it was interesting because in all of his reports, he said he is suffering from, you know, sexual sadism. Uh, he is suffering from sadistic personality. Well, hang on. He's not suffering. Yeah. His victims are suffering. So that was, I always thought, what, what a load of nonsense. But um, I hadn't been warned about him. So I was the new girl on the block. And I think I was about 23, maybe 24 at that time. So I was having my lunch and it happened to be cream of tomato soup. Heinz, obviously it has to be Heinz, cream of tomato soup. But of all the things that I could have been eating. And he came up behind me and quite literally in the blink of an eye popped his eye out and it fell in my soup. And of course I didn't no, you know it's just a giant marble. If you think of it like that, but a giant I was, marble. Yeah, I was spattered <laughs> with blood. <laughs> I felt, you know, because that's what it is. There's, there's an eye in my soup, and I'm covered in red. You know, your mind doesn't compute what it is. It's a marble with 
Heinz tomato soup, but I screamed the place down. And I remember looking at him, and of course he's got this kind of sunken eye at this point, but his other eye was studying me really very intently. And you could see that he was really enjoying the horror on my face. And so the nursing staff took him off and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, he does tend to do that. You know, he wants to get a bit of a, a shock out of people. He used to do it to visitors all the time. We'd just pop his eye out, you know. So, um, but he did it a few times because obviously, you know, I was, I was, you know, he could get a rise out of me. It's probably not the right terminology to use, but, mm. uh, you know. So eventually what I had to do, and I thought it was a really important lesson, actually, as a forensic psychologist... I just used to scoop his eye out out of oh. my lunch, yeah? And I just used to put it to one side and then I'd just carry on eating. <laughs> See, I'd pinch it. You wouldn't have it back. <laughs> <laughs> there, are kind of, there are human rights issues with that kind of thing. Removal Put it on of people's a, a body ring. parts. Come back the next day, yeah. on a ring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Removal of people's body parts, even if they're just uh, glass ones. Yeah, oh. it's, it's, it's not the done thing. So, and eventually, he, he left me alone because he wasn't getting that response. And so I always talk about, to trainees, the you know, that putting the eyeball to one side, which is basically your more rational side, mm. talking your emotional side down off a ledge, really, and you have to do that all the time as a How many times did he do it to you before you were able to just pop it to one side um, yeah, and not you know, shock you? Of, yeah, about three or four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about three or four before he started to, you know. Yeah. I still, I mean, I used to blush. I'm a redhead, so you can imagine. So I just go bright red. So I've kind of perfected the poker face a bit, a bit more now. <laughs> it's something that you have to, you have to learn if you want to survive in uh, forensic psychology. But I, you know, I've seen, um, I've seen some psychology assistants go by the wayside when, when confronted with, you know, naked men from behind curtains or body parts and you name it. <laughs> Wow. Is yeah. that very common? Uh, yeah, fairly common. <laughs> fairly <laughs> common. I mean, when you work with... I worked predominantly with, with sex offenders. Mm. And I worked with sex offenders who had uh, mental health problems, which may or may not have been related to their offending, most likely not. Um, and with people with learning disabilities, I remember that there was a guy, and he was about six foot five, and he was hugely hugely overweight as a result of probably medication and bad hospital food and he used to hide behind um curtains in the day room and you know it was like fooling nobody you've got this huge <laughs> mass behind it's when you see kids play hide and seek behind it yeah, exactly so it's like you, know, you, you see those cartoons with a python that's got a bowling ball in its stomach it's like it's pretty obvious so you just keep your eyes up yeah because he'd be naked behind the... Oh. Behind, oh, completely naked. And he's waiting for you to go past so that he can jump out. So you'd see him and you'd just say, right, excuse me, get to your room, please. And you just keep your eyes upwards, you know, so you're not seeing anything that uh, you don't want to see. But I've seen him jump out at uh, a few newer staff members and uh, they've not always lasted the course. No. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so... Two of our guests recently have brought up that thing about the flashes. John Wedger, Kareen Hutz about mm. about the trajectory of the men not becoming killers and doing really, you know, more much more it's serious. About rate, the bar dropping. Yeah. Yeah, I I think there are so many red flags that get ignored. It's ridiculous. I was reading yesterday about a guy who uh, wasn't given a prison sentence and wasn't given any form of rehab or anything at all. Really, it was just a well off off you pop. Um, and he had beaten his girlfriend and also strangled his girlfriend. And we know that strangulation is a massive red flag. It's a massive predictor for future fatal violence. It's actually a massive, pre um, it's a massive predictor in the US of gun violence. So, you know, it's, it's like, well, hang on a minute. What, what more do you want here? you can see what category of offender he's falling into and nothing is being done about it. And brilliant work has been done over the past few years looking at the, the timeline to a homicide. So I don't know whether you're familiar with Jane Monkton Smith's work. No. No. She's a criminologist and she's looked at domestic homicides and she has, she has basically found a really predictable pattern of behaviour 
So it's eight stages. So it's eight steps, if you like, to murder. Okay. Yeah. And I can't, I can't remember all of them, but they're, you know, it, it's, it's there. It, it characterises so many of the domestic homicides that she looked at, and she looked at, you know, nearly 400 of them. So we now know what precedes a murder, but yet we don't intervene to stop it becoming a murder because of all kinds of reasons. It can be that, you know, police are just badly, badly trained or not sufficiently trained or they're overwhelmed, they're overworked, bits of information aren't aren't connecting. You know, I don't think that it's that they don't care, it's that they don't don't know these things. But there's so much knowledge out there, we should be preventing more crime than, than we are. And I always mm. say that preventing crime, you know, I'd, I'd rather somebody doesn't kill somebody and doesn't end up in prison. Definitely. Yeah? Yeah, from, from the victim point of view, but also from the offender point of view as well. You know, nobody, nobody profits, do they, from it? So, yeah, I don't know why we don't do better. We need more people like you in charge of government policy. Mm. This is the problem, isn't it, that the government don't listen to experts. And I know that we're all meant to be really tired of experts, aren't we, at the moment, but there's a reason for that. Again, I'm going to go back to when I was um, at Wakefield Prison. So, you know, 1992, around that kind of time, I went into university. Then I was at Wakefield Prison, 1996. And what had been happening in this time is we'd had the, the Bulger killing in 1992. And both political parties were kind of competing with each other as to who could be seen to be the toughest on crime. And that's what wins votes. And now all of these years, yeah, down the line, where are we? 2021, this is still what political parties look at to, to, to win votes. Well, we're being tough on crime. We're being really, really tough. Um, and so they're not, they're not prepared to listen to more creative ideas which are to do with the prevention of crime. They just want to show how, you know, how mean they can be once, once somebody's already perpetrated a crime. And at that point, it's too late. And that's why some of the Scandinavian countries have took it out of the hands of the politicians because all they care about is the votes. Mm. Yeah. And we've seen far greater results. Oh, God. I mean, their, their re-offence rates are so low in comparison to ours. And isn't that what, it, that's what it's all about, isn't it? You know, Look at the money, the cost of the taxpayers, all yeah, that's saved. Yeah, exactly. Then. And it makes... Well, yeah, the cost of the taxpayer is often less, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I've been spending some time in the Netherlands because I've been I've been interviewing con artists, infamous con artists. Oh, Are we wow. allowed to name any names? Yeah, yeah, because I think you'll know. I, I, I interviewed <laughs> Matthew Cox. Yes. Never a dull moment with Matthew Cox. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed Matthew, that. I cannot believe you didn't tell me you were in Europe. We would have flipped, got you on the red eye to London and done a podcast interview. Uh, Frederick Bourdain who uh, you might have seen a, a documentary called The Imposter. No. The Imposter. Yes. Oh. What's that about? I he, haven't seen he, that. Oh, my goodness. Is That's one good? of my all-time favourite documentaries. It's in he, my top ten. He, he was a real... Do you want well, to explain what, what he yes, did? Yes, please. He is somebody who, as an adult, impersonates being a, a 15 or 16-year-old child. And he's done this continuously throughout, uh, you know throughout his 20s and 30s in order to go and live in a, you know, a foster home or in an orphanage because he wants to recreate this idea of a, of a perfect childhood because his childhood was Have incredibly traumatic. Yeah, yeah, and he actually pretended to be a missing boy from Texas who would have been 16. This was when he was in his 20s. He's French. He's got a French accent. The boy that he impersonated had blue eyes. Frederick Bourdain has got brown eyes. And yet the family of this missing boy took him in. So he went to live in Texas and he lived wow. there for six months until eventually a private detective who was watching him on TV talking about how he'd been abducted and trafficked and how he'd been experimented on and, you know, sexually abused, said, hang on a minute, these, these are not the same, these are not the same boys. You know, it's clear that these are not the same boys. How can this be? And his family refused to have um, 
DNA test done. Because they believe well, so much. So, yeah. Frederick Bourdain now says that uh, the reason for that is that they had killed their son. And so they knew that he was an imposter all along. But this has never been proven. So there's no evidence to, to back that up. So it will remain... It will remain a mystery. What's he like in the flesh? Um, you know, he comes across on the imposter as really creepy. And he wasn't creepy, but he was, of course, he was odd. You know, he was very, very odd. And he was actually telling me, he's the same age as me, 47. I can still get away with this. I can still, I can still pretend to be a you know, a 14, 15, 16-year-old boy. He was saying, I, I cover my body in hair removal cream. You Has know, he got I've, a baby face? Um, no, he's, he's got quite a square jaw, to be <laughs> honest. And he's got a widow's peak. So he was saying, well, you know, I wear a baseball cap and I tell people that I've got scars on my head and I wear clothes that are too big for me so I look smaller and I just, you know, I don't talk very much and I change the way that I walk and I change the way, you know, that I talk. You know, and I, I pretend that I'm interested in all of these children's things because I am, you know, I'm, I'm creating this, um, you know, this environment where I can live out this fantasy that I'm a loved for and cared for child. Does he still do it? Well, I said, are your days of being a con artist over? And he couldn't tell me that they were. Oh. He was not going back to France. He was going to... Uh, I don't, God, God knows where. He was going to Bosnia or somewhere strange like that. I know, and he has, he has this history of showing up in war-torn countries where obviously there's a high level of orphans and presenting himself to, to, to services saying, you know, help me. I'm a, I'm, a, I've, I'm a victim of the war. I'm, you know, I've not got parents anymore. So I did wonder whether he was, he was off to, to do the same thing somewhere else. Wow. wow. So I don't I don't know. I mean whether he could get away with it these days or not. I really don't know. But yeah, you just I'd can't like to write that him kind trying. of thing. Sorry? I'd like to see him try. A 47 just a 47 around like a 16 years old. year old boy. Well, the documentary yeah. is mind blowing. But, I, I mean that. the thing is though, who who would do a thing like this? People don't suspect because you just think nobody nobody would even attempt something as frankly bonkers as that mm. and that's what works works in his favor so i guess people looked at him and just thought well you know he's a fairly you know he's he's he's, a, he's an adolescent boy he's growing into his manhood i don't know but what I did he know. lack in his childhood then that he's his childhood his was 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 wretched as you can imagine and i think mm. that the the big thing was that um he was part Algerian and actually his, his family were real racists and he was subject to racist abuse and physical abuse. He also says sexual abuse as a child and he was constantly rejected. And I think that he just grew to hate himself. And there was, there was a moment because he really didn't accept that there were any victims in this, you know, this charade. And I really pushed him on this. But he was talking about how he sometimes used to mutilate his his face. Do you know if this is for a sexual reason or just no? For apparently, a, no, no, no sexual reason at all was ever established, and he says absolutely not. N not nothing of that type was ever ever suggested, uh, and he says it's just because he wanted to. You know, he wanted to just recreate recreate a perfect Walton's like childhood. But in actual fact, he didn't recreate anything of the type. And he was sent to various foster homes where he says that he was terribly abused. Whether that's true or not, I don't I don't know. Because he was really, you know, he presents himself as a victim. That's his whole that's his whole shtick. Yeah. Mm. So I don't know. But you know, whatever he was recreating, it wasn't it wasn't the perfect childhood. Wow. Um, but he was escaping all adult responsibilities because between the ages of, you know, 16 and something like 33. He was constantly being cared for in a series of, of orphanages. So he didn't have to get a job and, and you know, get a place to live, pay the bills like, like everybody else. That's one way to do it. Yeah. But <laughs> he just said, you know, I really hate... It's really difficult to be me. I hate to be me. So he's got real identity 
issues. Mm. And he was saying, I'm not a con artist. I'm not a con artist. But where is that line between being really emotionally needy and clearly struggling to function as an adult and and being a being a con artist i think that at the point at which you're infiltrating people's homes pretending to be their missing child you you've, you you you're going to that territory aren't you definitely yeah do you want to explain to Jen who Matt Cox is and how it went with him? Oh, so Matt Cox is somebody who defrauded the Bank of America out of something like, was it $55 million? And basically his whole thing was mortgage frauds. And a lot of it was about creating fake um, documents to... to um, to support a, a fake ID, basically, that he could take mortgages out on. And actually, he's a great artist, and so he used those artistic skills. But he's also... I, I mean, how would you describe him? He's... You would like to interview Matt Cox. Really? He is a talker, very charismatic, very smooth. I don't know about smooth, but he's definitely... <laughs> he's, 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 chari- he's charismatic... You see through people more than most, I think. Oh, do you know, it was funny. He said to me, he said, you know, I've um, I've, uh, I've, got on the phone to uh, my girlfriend and said, you know, this chick doesn't like me. This chick doesn't like me. And actually, I really enjoyed the time that I spent with him. But there were parts of him that obviously I don't like. And he will say himself, you know, well, he actually introduces himself as, hey, I'm a psychopath. <laughs> Does he? Yeah. yeah Have you exactly. done the psychopath test with him? No, no I, did a, I, did a, I did a short uh, Zoom with him, I think. Or, yeah. No, he's actually not being, di- he has not been diagnosed as a psychopath. And he has got certain traits that you would associate with that label. And yes, he's got the he's got the superficial charm, and he's he's you know he's he's incredibly manipulative. He can be coercive. Um, but I said to him, you need to be careful, really, what what labels you apply to yourself. And it's kind of almost as like he's now got this um, this this brand as. This guy that has, you know, pulled off these amazing, audacious cons. So what was it he was doing? So mortgage, it was mortgage fraud. fraud. Yeah, but how? Yeah, mortgage fraud. Multiple I mean, identities. So he'd go through, get all these different mortgages. How many properties? He'd get properties? multiple mortgages on the same property at the same time in a fake oh, identity. Oh, wow. And multiple fake identities. So yeah. he'd just move around the country doing this. And it, and it wasn't exactly victimless, but because he yeah. wasn't holding somebody up at a bank, he, he, he views it that way. Mm. And I think what it is about him, people, people, like, people like these people, don't they? Because they think that it's almost like Robin Hood, but it's not Robin Hood because you're not stealing from the rich and then giving it to the poor. You're, you're stealing from effectively all of us and you're keeping it for yourself. But he would go into banks and if anybody would question his idea his ID rather, and you know, his, his need for a mortgage, he'd be like, hey, get your supervisor, get your supervisor. So, you so know, he'd call on the power. Yeah, incredible bravado with mm. it. And he enjoyed the adventure of it. You know, he clearly got off on the adventure of it. He loves cons. You know, I think he sees them as an intellectual and creative, creative challenge. Is he a bit of a narcissist? He's very much a narcissist. I was going to say. But <laughs> again, when I spoke to him, I saw a real human, non-psychopathic side to him when I was talking to him about his relationship with his, his father. And he had that typical upbringing, very much like Donald Trump, actually, and I call mm. it too much but yet not enough because he was given lots of things materially, but yet he never felt safe in his home and he never felt loved and approved of by his father. So he never got those emotional needs met. And, you know, again, when you when you drill down into it, you can kind of you can you can start to understand his story a bit more and see him as more than just this this brand, you know, brand Cox, which is just <laughs> out there. But, you know, he's great fun to, to spend some time with. But, you know, am I going to buy everything that he says? No. So what's he selling? <laughs> well, he's selling, he's selling himself now, so, so is to it, speak. Is he doing you know, a book? Do he's prolific. He has, to give him yeah. his dues, he has yeah. helped um, some prisoners get their books out and he's got his own books out and he's got his channel. He's interviewing a lot of people. And Matt 
Don't ever come to Europe without letting me know again. Otherwise, Jen will be coming for you. Believe me. And you know what? <laughs> we want to get you in the in the studio. He's, he's got skills to pay the bills. So skills to pay the bills. He's got <laughs> skills to pay the bills. So good on him. I hope he does well. You know. Yeah. He seems yeah. to be doing well. Yeah. So, what yeah. other con artists have you tackled? Um, oh God, we so we, we we met we met loads. I mean, I, I, what what was missing sadly was a love rat. I really wanted oh. to interview. What's you know, a love rat? A love rat. So somebody who, who had several wives, maybe. Yeah, creates a relationship with somebody in order to fleece them of their oh, money. Because yeah. that I think would have been would have been really someone with a yeah. lot of relationships really going around the country fleecing women lying about their I interviewed a woman who'd been fleeced and she traced it back to a kid out of Africa and she was very wealthy and she went out of there and, sp and spoke to all the kids who were doing the fleecing mm. and said why are you doing this and, and and they said here's how we grew up we got no jobs we got no money and she built like a, a, a business college forum out there for them to get to stop fleecing people. It was Good an amazing her. story. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. it. This yeah. is the kind yeah. of thing that this is the kind of thing that I support. Mm. Um, you know, I, I'm very interested in the psychology of con artists. And again, I suppose it goes with my fascination for you know, understanding deceit and liars and deception and all of that kind of thing. But what I've been amazed by is a, how they achieve this kind of almost celebrity status, which of course I don't approve of, but just how really skilled they are. I can see why they're called con artists. <laughs> well, their whole life becomes that lie. Well, well, yeah, but I mean, the, 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 they are really skilled. You know, the, there's one guy that we were talking to, we, we, we did lots of tests uh, on him in terms of his emotional intelligence, his ability to read facial, um, you know, facial cues and et cetera, et cetera. And he was functioning higher than CIA operatives. Wow. Yeah. So this is it. You can use these skills for good. You can use these powers for good. They just need to be channeled in the right direction. Did you interview that one they made the movie out about? Who's, um, he did get hired by the CIA, I think. Or he got hired by oh, the US was, government. That, that was, uh, you know, the Catch Me If You Can. Yes. Yes. No, I've not, I've not met him. Okay. No. But I, I've met a few guys. I met uh, Christophe Rockencourt. Hello who uh, was a French guy who, when he was homeless, on, yeah. actually managed to... Are you being distracted by my beautiful dog? <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I, got, um, I got dogs when I was being stalked. Oh. And I got really big dogs, as you what can imagine. Of, what breed? Uh, chow Chows. Oh, really? So same colour hair than me, uh, as me. So uh, quite often we would win the dog that looks most like the owner competitions <laughs> at local fairs. Yeah, but really big really big eight stone chow chows i've mm. got but then uh, i lost one and i thought that i really needed to downsize mm. so i've ended up with him yeah. and he's not going to be a great deal of use in terms of security around the house <laughs> so are you able to talk about your stalking yeah okay yeah. how did it come about well you'd think wouldn't it that it would have come about because of uh my my co career in terms of you know working working in hospitals and prisons. It didn't, it came as a result of appearing on television. So I started appearing in crime documentaries as a talking head. And it's just, it's just amazing, isn't it? Just putting yourself out there, even on quite a, a small scale, just attracts people. And it turns out that I was being stalked from about 2009, I just wasn't aware of it. And how, do you know how it started? Well, um, apparently this guy says that he'd, he'd written to me uh, to say, oh, I've seen you on TV and can you give some advice to my daughter? She works in probation or something. I don't know because I get literally hundreds of these, of these letters. So, I, you know, I probably did write back to him or somebody that works for me probably wrote back to him. And then the next I knew about it was in 2011 and I got a message on Facebook saying, hey, I've set up these websites in your name. So I've bought kerrydanes.com, kerrydanes.co.uk, et cetera, et cetera. And I want you to give me your photographs and I want you to, you know, engage in these websites. So I was thinking... So he's I... brought up your name on every .com, .co.uk yes. for the purpose of putting your photos on there. Who knows? Who knows? For, for, for running a, 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 a website. Sort of... Yeah, a website for me. So 
I'm a forensic psychologist. I am not Britney Spears. I don't need... <laughs> Britney thumbs. Yeah, I don't need this. I mean, I have actually got a website at the minute, which I'm kind of in two minds about whether I even need to keep or not. But this mm. is not what I need in my life. No. So he was told very politely, thank you, however, sorry, I don't want to engage in this. And if you've bought web domains, I will pay you whatever you've paid for them. So a web domain costs, what, about £25? If that. Yeah, if that. So he wrote back, well, I don't want to be psychoanalyzed by you. So very strange, immediately very strange. And uh, these web domains, I want £3,000 per web domain. Well, on your bike, son, because you're not going to try and extract money out of me. Now, that is clear blackmail, I think, because he was actually saying, I can put whatever I want on these websites. Mm. you know i can i can do whatever and he'd, he'd actually managed to get hold of some personal pictures from my facebook so that was my fault because i'd obviously not set my security levels high enough and um and then he he, he started writing on these websites but he was writing yeah, kerry danes isn't a qualified psychologist so every, he started a hate mail yeah website. every every case that she's been involved with needs to be you know, re-looked at and, you know, all these cases that she's been an expert witness for need to be reopened. And then things about Kerry Danes has got huge boobs and, you know, this, that oh. and the other. Well, <coughs> yeah, OK, mm. we, we can see that. And really, it doesn't need to be it doesn't need to be put on a website. But then mm. he started to write increasingly odd, increasingly sexual things. And he was commenting about clothes that I was wearing. So he'd say, well, that pair of jeans, you know, doesn't suit her that she was wearing. And I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute. I'm a talking head on documentaries. I'm not a talking bottom, yes. So how does he know what what I'm wearing? He can't have possibly seen this on so television. So you would only be filmed sort of from the yeah, and I, you know, waist I don't up. Tend to, yeah, and, I don't, and these are not the clothes that I'm wearing on TV. So clearly he's, he's seeing me. In my day-to-day -day life. And when I went to the police, now bear in mind how many times I've worked with the police. I've got friends in the police force. And it was like, well, is this actually stalking? We're not sure whether it's stalking or yeah. not. Because this was 2012 and stalking hadn't been defined by law at that point. You know, it might be harassment. We're not sure. Well, we'll send somebody around to talk to him. So somebody goes around <laughs> to talk to him. And again, that's put on his website. I told the police officer that came to see me, yes, I know Kerry Dane's address. Yes, I know where she lives. But they obviously don't see me as dangerous because they've only sent one police officer. And I told the police officer that Kerry Danes must think he's a psychopath. I'm thinking, what? Right. So it basically carried on. I didn't get any help and I had to take him to civil court to have these websites taken down because people were actually writing to him thinking that he was me. So can you imagine, I do so much work with solicitors. If they'd have emailed something confidential to him, <sighs> you know, it just doesn't bear, doesn't bear thinking about. So it cost me £60,000 to take him to court, to have him told that he had to take these, these websites down because the police would not arrest him for stalking at that point. And to cut a long story short... I had never seen this man, so I was getting really quite paranoid, wondering who this guy was. You know, I'm in the I'm in the post office. I, I don't know. I don't know who he is. I don't know whether he's behind me. You know, I'm coming home from work. I'm working with really dangerous people during the day, and then I'm coming home from work, and you're closing my curtains. Home. Yeah, yeah, and feeling scared and buying huge, great big dogs so that I feel more protected. See, that is a concern of mine and my privacy concern of yeah. stalking. Yeah. I've been stalked before, so I'm well, still continuing. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, well, talk to me about it because I kind of took it on as a bit of an issue because what I did was I stopped appearing on TV programmes. This guy did not go away, yeah. So bearing in mind that I'd taken him to court, it was the first time I'd ever seen him, by the way. I walked into court, sat down, then he walked in and I realised it was the same guy that had been sat almost next to me in the canteen downstairs and I wasn't aware of it. He was sitting literally behind me so that we were, we were back to back with each other. And uh, he said in, in the courtroom, oh, well, I was upset with her. I was upset with her. But, you know, I'm done with her now. I'm done. As if we'd had some sort of relationship. But anyway, he reared his ugly head again, started writing to me in 2016. 
he was going to take me to court, all right, this is hilarious, for an an unpaid bill of £26,000. He had charged me for his time in stalking me and his time in creating the websites. He'd even, and this is hilarious, he'd even charged me £500 in travel expenses. Yeah. What I is know. going through that guy's head? Is that mental illness? Definitely. Um, do you know what? No, no, it's entitlement. Yes. And I think that we're too, we too often jump to mental, man, mental health problems as an explanation. And I think that it's really unfair on people who have mental health problems. Mm. It was entitlement. And I Maybe actually found out... Maybe a as a child or something and had that mentality of... You know, and, stalking, and, and, and that women should, should, should jump to his, you know... Beg to his knees. Do, yeah, play yeah. to his knees. Exactly that. And it turned out that he had been warned for harassment of somebody else. So he had a history of this. And a few things happened. Basically, to cut a long story short, I felt that um, somebody tried to run me over when I was walking with my dogs. And they stopped the car and I looked at them and I thought, that really looks like that guy who was stalking me but I saw him once in court and this was a couple of years ago you know so why why is that and you know it, it was really strange and actually I followed the car because it was going down the road which was a dead end and I thought well you've just nearly taken my dog out you know I'm not shy I was going to give him a, a piece of my mind and he actually um parked in in a in a club that is at the bottom of my road. So he parked in an empty car park and he stayed there. And when I walked into the car park and I realised, actually, hang on a minute, we're alone. Mm. And I thought, no, you know, he's, he doesn't live down this road. You know, there's, there's no event going on here. I need to get out of here. He drove out very, very slowly. And I think that I was so used to being very logical and not going with my gut emotion that I took down the number of his car but then I thought to myself, no, I'm being paranoid. It's been years. So, you know, that gut instinct, it's there for a reason, isn't it? Mm. And then I found my cat dead. <sighs> yes. And I don't know how the cat died. All I can tell you is that the cat had been thrown over the fence and somebody had written Jill Dando on the fence. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, the cat did not choose that time to evolve, you know? grow a thumb and write on my fence. So it was at that point that the police took it seriously. It took to that point. It took to that yeah. point, yeah, despite, you know, the the arguments I'd had with them. And at that point, they did, um, you know, they, they arrested him. They basically said to me, oh, he's just a sad, inadequate, he's just a sad, inadequate man. Well, hang on a minute. You know, he's hang having a massive impact on my life here. Mm. Um, and... They took his computers off him, but they said that they didn't have the resources to look at them, even though he'd admitted that he held extensive um, documents relating to me on his computer. Jesus so he should have been, he should have been prosecuted for stalking. He was given what they call a harassment warning. So I then joined a campaign, um, and I, I linked up with um, the. The, the stalking awareness uh, helpline that's run by the Susie Lamplu Trust. And I joined a campaign to basically get stalking taken more seriously. And now the police are not able to give a harassment warning because it's utterly, it's pointless. It's basically, it's a piece of paper with your name on it and his name on it. And say, it says, you know, don't, don't do it again or don't do it within the next 12 months. And actually, I think what it did was just bolster this impression that did he had that we were connected in, in some time. kind Sorry. of way yeah um, did you get an injunction in this time um i didn't get an injunction but i you know I, i'm trying to think what the conditions of the um he's not allowed to hold information regards me he's certainly not allowed to own websites you know and put information about me that's not true or is true even on a website um but i never got my sixty thousand pounds back because he's not got it to give me and, um, you know, and it, it was just, it shouldn't have, it shouldn't have taken this. And actually I was doing my mental arithmetic because I'm a forensic psychologist. Well, he's a stranger, you know, I'm more likely to be killed by a stalker who is a current or former partner. He doesn't fall in that category, but I shouldn't have to do calculations about whether I'm going to be murdered or not. The police should be taking action. 
And actually now, because the legislation has changed, because of the campaign that I got involved with, at a fairly late stage, I have to say, so, you know, it wasn't me pushing this. Um, it was it was other, you know, other great, predominantly women, yet again. Um, now I know that I've got the law to back me up. Should he raise his head ever again, then there are certain things that the police have to do and they have to justify why it's not stalking before they treat it as not stalking. And also they have to, you know, the, they have to put in protective measures now. So that has to be at the forefront of, of their response. So, uh, you know, we, we got various things done as a, as a result of, um, of that campaign. And I wouldn't have joined it had I not have had that first-hand experience of being stalked. Mm. So I was glad that I could turn it into yeah, something positive. Good. And I thought, I don't want to be in this, you know, this weird... I'm, I'm not related to this person at all. I don't know him. I don't want to know him. He's nothing to me. And therefore, I don't want to change my behaviour as a result of of him so I just thought sod it and you know I got a phone call the same week that that my cat um died more or less saying do you want to do you want to do faking it and I'd said no to so many things prior to that so I said yes yes I do want to do faking it and I, and I went back on on tv I'm not going to hide because course, yeah. somebody's you know wants yeah. to wants to intimidate yeah. me. You're right to give Pooch a little roll because he's in the snoring position. Oh, oh is he? Yeah, yeah. Do you, want, <laughs> you can hand. Do you want to pass him over to me? Yeah, with a nice little snooze. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. So is is the situation with your stalker? Is that calmed down or is that? It's calmed down because he doesn't uh, know where I reside. Um, when yeah. he did, I had orange paint chucked at my front door. Um, I had to install CCTV this back down in Devon. Yeah, that's what I did. Um, it, it didn't stop him driving car park, uh, past constantly, go through my bins, get email addresses out my bins, well, contact my family. Stalking, the whole thing that characterises stalking yeah. and actually differentiates it from other crimes I'm is scared. persistence and obsession. So it doesn't matter what you do, this is it. So I, I, I felt helpless. And yeah. Every time I rang the police, they did exactly. absolute jack shit about it. And to the point, because he was always changing his SIM card, because I was blocking numbers, blocking numbers. He must yeah. have a, a whole apartment full of just fucking SIM cards. Yeah. And there was nothing I could do. I felt helpless. I was looking over my shoulder. I Still to this day, um, I get emails come through and other bits and bobs from him. This is still ongoing. Um, I've tried ringing the Devon and Cornwall police station. Can't get through to them for love nor money. And even if I did, they probably wouldn't do anything again. So it's really put me off. Ah, well, maybe we should have a word then, because there are certain things that you can say. And certainly, you know, you can you can ring the anti-stalking helpline and yeah. somebody from the Susie Lamplew Trust will talk you through. And if necessary, advocate for you on your behalf and speak to, you know, your, your local police. But yeah, it's it's just it's just ridiculous. It's it just is. ridiculous. The lack of response. And I was told, oh, well, it's just a dispute over web domains. So quite often they don't they don't join the dots together and look at this it's, it it's might the start pattern of behaviour like yeah. that and they might only look at the internet side but like you said he was telling you what clothes you were wearing yeah. I don't know if I could be you know spotted or obviously he's probably seen well he's seen me on YouTube hasn't he um, because he started commenting on commenting on some of the videos I believe it's him it's like different names yeah. but from various things he's oh yeah saying. I got a few bad you know bad reviews on my book and that kind of thing and you think oh hang on I know a the way it's yeah. written I can tell yeah um, because it's been ongoing for three years now I want to say two three years and it's yeah, it got really, really bad at yeah. one point. Yeah, and it so. just really annoyed me. This, you know, the police said, "Oh well, you know, he's he's just a, he's just a sad, inadequate, yeah. you know, a lonely man." Well, I don't care. That's not an excuse. Doesn't mean that you can come on. Me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just can sit on me. Okay. He matches your suit. Oh, it does match my suit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it's something because at the moment it's it's down to just. Facebook and emails, most of the emails go through to my spam. My sister sorted that out, but I wanted to stop. I don't want to ever see a message from him again in my life. So I'd like to see how I can get through to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. He's very cute. I think, is he trying to make his way over to... He's a bit of a mummy's boy. He's coming oh, back he's to mummy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, come on. There we go. Oh, look. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Exactly. Little, little tongue. <laughs>
There we go. So we were at the story of where you were entering um, the, the various prisons, but you, you do end up encountering some serious offenders. Now, when I was growing up, mm. the biggest in the headlines were Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, and the Moors murderers, Ian Brady and yeah, Myra Hindley. Yeah, I met Hindley. both of them. Yeah, no, I haven't met Myra Hindley, but, yeah, I've met those. And... Uh, and I, I met Dennis Nielsen, and he used to keep in contact. Oh, really? <laughs> Whether I liked it or not, yeah, he kept in contact for a, for a while. So someone who's committed that level of offence mm -hmm. then, what's the protocol when you go into a room with that person? It's the same as, you know, in any maximum security prison. So the, the protocol is that you've usually got an alarm that's attached to your belt, and you just pull it if needs be. And often there'll be um, a switch on the wall as well, and you press that should you need it. But other than that, that's it. You know, people say to me, well, you know, do you go in with with somebody? Have you ever had to press no. the uh, switch? Hey, have I had? No, I haven't had to press the switch. But what did happen, and again, this was back in the day in Wakefield Prison when the prison officers wanted to have a little bit of a laugh. Um, I the, the first thing that I did in Wakefield Prison was um, an interview study, interviewing all the men in the prison who had both raped and murdered a woman. So completely inappropriate, really, for a you know, 21-year-old student. And um, I was doing one of those interviews and the, um, I think I went over my time, basically. So it was time for lunch. So the prison officers decided to lock me in the cell with the guy that I was interviewing. And so when it came time for me to leave, obviously I couldn't leave. And it became obvious to both of us that we were locked in together. And he was really getting off on the fact that I was, I was frightened and uh, he, had, he had strangled a woman and he actually uh, leant over the table and attempted to stroke my neck, just attempted to stroke down my neck like that and said, oh, you've got a very pretty neck. Oh. I know, yeah, really, yeah, it's kind of like, what, what bad movies have you been watching, really, that you would want to do that? And it was another inmate that banged on the door. And that's often the case, that it's, it's another inmate that is looking out for you and uh, said, are you okay in there, miss? And I said, yes. And he said, uh, well, you know, don't worry because, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get, we're getting an officer for you to unlock you. And then said to the, to the guy that I was interviewing, and uh, she better come out of there, you know, happy or we'll be seeing you later on. Mm. So it was the inmates that had my back. It wasn't the officers. Bloody hell. Wow, what wow, yeah. swines. Yeah. So when you were sat down with Nilsson then, what was your goal when you were interviewing him? Well, Dennis Nielsen actually used to phone me, yeah, so there was no reason for him to phone me other than he had seen me on a documentary and he wanted to make sure that should I appear in any documentaries regarding him that I got my information right. Oh, actually. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, he was a, he was, he was a big complainer, he was very, very bitter, and he could complain about literally anything. And he was quite happy to talk about himself. He was quite happy to talk about his offences. And actually, it wasn't something that I wanted to encourage because, as far as I was concerned, it was just... Feeding it was just his ego. Rehearsing. Yeah. yeah, it was just rehearsing this, this fantasy, to be honest. So it wasn't something that I really wanted to get in, involved in. So he wasn't somebody that I would welcome a telephone call from. And eventually I did get called guardian on my office phone <laughs> yeah, because of him, so that I could avoid him. Because he could be quite tedious, to Was be honest. Was he quite articulate, like he appears? Yeah, he's very, he's very articulate and quite funny. Oddly enough, he sees himself, I'm talking in the... He saw himself, because he's died recently, um, he saw himself as quite the socialist, which is strange, really, for mm. a serial killer. Um, he talked me through in very explicit detail the, the way to dismember a body without making too much mess. You know, you wait for the right amount of time to pass so the, the blood is coagulated, etc., etc. How long is that? Yeah, I know. Not, not yeah. that interested. But... And, and then... <laughs> Free stalker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then he also talked about how he was complaining about, you know, prison regimes, the food in the prison, you know, etc., etc., etc. Was it not to his taste? No, no. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and he was, he was a trained butcher and, uh, you know, fancied himself as a bit of a chef. But um, listening to his tapes, it sounds like he could narrate like a Mister Man cartoon or something. His mm. voice is like that kind of voice. Do you think? Yeah. I don't know. He's got these kind of soft Scottish tones, hasn't he? Mm. But I, I was always just 
always found him very bitter. As I say, it was very, very bitter and complaining. And so I could see that he would not be everybody's uh, cup of tea. Captain's tongue, so, sorry, is right out. <laughs> I know, he's got an amazing tongue, hasn't he? It, it just kind of... I don't know how it fits back in his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> he was poking his tongue at the camera for quite a while. Yeah. Do you think Nilsson's grandfather then was what set him off and no, in, you see, we, we interfered always, with him? We, mm. Right. Or is that just a story he's right. made up? The thing about Dennis, as far as I was concerned, mm. was that he was a real fantasist. Mm. You know, that's where it all starts, doesn't it? With, with fantasy. And actually, he fantasised a lot of episodes from his past. So I don't know whether they were true or not. And I am the last person to say, if somebody says that they were abused, that we should say that they are lying. Mm. Yeah. So I just want to make that clear. So uh, I think what was more significant is that he talked to me about how he was bullied at school because he was very effeminate and he didn't feel that he could come out as a gay man in this you know, this this Scottish fishing village because it just wouldn't have been accepted. And he um, he was bullied by a boy who he says, and I don't know whether this is fantasy or not, later drowned. And he saw him, which wasn't uncommon actually in this, you know, it's a fishing village. So he saw him being pulled out of the water and he says that he was semi-naked and he was just, you know, this floppy, pale body. And he saw him and he was sexually attracted to him. But also he suddenly felt powerful because this boy could no longer bully him. And he said that he, he started to think about how this boy's body was going to be attended to by nurses and would be dressed and, you know, put in a coffin, etc., etc. And that the boy had no power over that, had no say over that. He was going to be completely passive. And so that started then to inform his sexual fantasy. And he says that he used to, um, he used to look at his brother and uh, molest his brother while his brother was asleep. Yeah. And he said that he, um, he started being interested in, in, in dead bodies. So he, he saw a, a picture that he found very arousing. It was called The Raft of the Medusa. And it's the scene of a shipwreck. And there is this, you know, this gorgeous bodied young man that's clearly been pulled out, of the, pulled out of the water. And you don't know whether he's dead or not, but he's certainly not in the best of states. Mm. And uh, he says that he used to look at this part of this picture. And that, again, would inform all of his sexual fantasies. Then he would start to, you know, put flour on his face, put talc and powder on his face and look in the mirror. And he would pretend that he was the dead body, yeah? So the development of necrophilia isn't something that happens literally in a moment when you see no. your, your, your grandfather in, in a coffin. Whether that contributed to the development of it, I don't know. I know that Brian Masters suggested, you know, at the moment that he was shown his grandfather's corpse unexpectedly by his mother, although this was kind of, you know, this is what they did back in the day, that love and death were fused in his mind. But that's, mm. you know, no offence to Brian Masters because his book is absolutely fantastic, but that is cack psychology, yeah? <laughs> so it, it's not the case that, you know, you don't become a serial killer like that. So I think that the development of necrophilia was what is significant for me, because obviously it always, I'm a social psychologist, I, it always comes back to sociology. I always think about, well, what if he had been accepted for his sexuality? Yeah. What, what different trajectory might his life had taken? Um, but I, th I think that's, yeah, that's what I found interesting about him. But I don't want to spend hours on the phone to Dennis Nielsen listening to how, you know, he had a, a corpse under under the floorboard and how he used to dress them and et cetera, et cetera. He used to dress them, what, the corpses? Yeah, he used to dress them because he had a particular, he thought that they looked particularly well in a white vest and, and white um, white boxer shorts. So he would, yeah, he, he would dress them. That was part of the rituals that he did with, with these dead bodies. He liked to not only have sexual contact with dead bodies, but also to, to be around them. 
Mm. So, so that's you know, why you kept them so long under yeah. the floorboards, etc. And I know that we were talking about this at CrimeCon um, with, um, or I was talking about this at CrimeCon with Dr. Mark Pettigrew, who knew Dennis Nielsen far better than, than I did. And he always felt that the act of dismembering the bodies almost felt like, you know, the end of a relationship to Dennis Nielsen because he he really did fantasize that these were his 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 partners you know he had created these perfectly passive partners that would never you know as far as Brian Masters was concerned, you know, would never leave him was significant, but I think more significant would never question him, would never argue with him, would never say no to him you know this this was somebody who was incredibly narcissistic and focused. Do you know how long needs. he used to keep the bodies for before he dismembered Kept the them? bodies for a, a, a long, long time. He would wrap them so that they would dry. And if you wrap a, a body... Mummify. Yeah, it, it tends to, to mummify. But it was only when the smell got too bad or literally he didn't have room for them mm. that he had to then think, well, what, what am I going to what am I going to do here? And that's when he started to, to burn them, burn them in his gardens and then ultimately, of course, flush them down his drains. Yeah. Yeah. Were the white outfits linked to the boy who drowned? I don't know. I don't know about that. I think it was just an aesthetic mm. that mm. that he liked. And actually, it's funny because I've seen oh. some home videos that were him with... Um, they were videoed by his partner at the time. So this was kind of in the early days of his killing, if not preceding his killing. And um, he, he himself is dressed in... in in these clothes and so mm. is his partner so i think this is just what he found you know different things float different people's boats don't they so for some people it might be a mankini for dennis nielsen it was a white vest. <laughs> yeah because some of the some of the survivors said that he'd almost drowned them but yeah. and then he got out so it was the drowning yeah, and then theme. he had conflict i think that he did have conflict at times and he said that he would get very very drunk in order to be able to so he must have felt some somebody. sort of guilt I think that he felt, I don't know, guilt is, is, is probably too strong a term, but I think he felt conflict. And this mm. is one of the big um, serial killer myths, isn't it? That they, you know, that they kill people with, with a total lack of remorse. I don't think he was able to have true empathy for them because I think he was just too immersed in his own, his own fantasy life but he would go out that night knowing that you know he intended to find a suitable victim i.e somebody that maybe had run away was estranged from his family somebody that wouldn't be looked for and then in order to kill them he would get himself absolutely ratted drunk and get them absolutely ratted drunk so you know they it was uh, it was very deliberate it was very pre-planned and premeditated of course was there anything in common with Jeffrey Dahmer and Nilsson? Yeah, I think what was the common factor is that they were both wanting this passive body that would be their, you know, their partner, as they would say. But obviously that's ridiculous, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a partner. It's a plaything, isn't it? So Jeffrey Dahmer was experimenting with, you know, could he drill into people's heads and, and, and create an almost living, you know, but a zombie who had no will. Uh, Dennis Nielsen wasn't quite that deluded. He, he knew that he had to kill people in order to, to meet this need that he had and he was willing to do it. Mm. What set Ian Brady off then? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know what, what set, set him, him off, off so to speak, but I think that I don't know at what point he became really very mentally unwell. And I don't know whether killing people made him mentally unwell or whether he was mentally unwell prior, prior to that. But I think what was more significant with him was this belief that he had which he had acquired from reading, well, he, he, he was reading Mein Kampf and various Nazi um, books. But I think more significant in his development was that he was reading works of the Marquis de Sade. Mm. And the Marquis de Sade's philosophy was basically that, um, you know, that mere mortals, you know, um, live according to a set of rules. But if you want to really be superior you eschew these rules 
And so Brady felt that he was superior to others and that he wanted to transcend, if you like, other people and transcend the laws of the land. And the way that to do this was to commit the perfect the perfect murders. Mm. And he was very interested in... Um, what were the two brothers in, um, in the America? Uh, was it Lower Band? I can't think. Oh, I can't think of the name of them. But there were two brothers in America... And he was quite interested in the murders that they'd committed. And he felt that he could do it better. I think he genuinely felt that he could he could commit murders and not be caught. He was that arrogant. And in doing so, he was, uh, you know, achieving this hedonistic high that was only reserved for those who dared and only reserved for those who were, you know, intellectually... Uh, able to to get away with this. So I think it was all to do again with his narcissism. And with Myra, the dynamic then between the two of them, did that exacerbate their individual tendencies? I don't think that Myra Hindley would have killed if it were not for the fact that she met Ian Brady. But um, Myra Hindley was a real, you know, she was a real tough northern scrapper. <laughs> her... her her father would go out, get himself drunk, and then get himself involved in a fight, you know, every weekend. And he would encourage Myra to fight. Yeah, and he would encourage her to fight boys, not just girls. This was, you know, she was, she was brought up to actually, to, to value violence. And, you know, clearly, clearly, you know, very, very uh, emotionally abusive. Mm. Um, but she was she was a tough northern cookie and she was a cold and callous cookie, I think. And I think that when she met uh, Ian Brady, she was very seduced and, you know, to a large extent groomed by him because he just seemed so, so different to everybody else in, in you know, in, in Manchester at that time. He was this this Scottish guy, you know, who's talking about Mein Kampf. This is not long after the war, don't forget. So he seems very daring. He seems very exciting. And he seems really intellectual, which really appealed to her. In fact, he's, he's quite a pseudo-intellectual. Mm. You know, he, he, he would quote poetry and, 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 you know, this works and that works, but he didn't necessarily understand it all. So he was a pseudo-intellectual. I think that Myra was actually the most intelligent, you know, part of that of that pairing. But he started to talk to her about his philosophy in life and she went for it. And he started to talk about, you know, what would it mean to commit the perfect murder? And she went for it. And he started to talk about, um, you know, things that they could do sexually, sadomasochism and they experimented with each other but there came a point obviously when he said well we could do this and mm. we could do this to children and she didn't say oh no. my god yeah so it seems that there was no you know there was no boundary for her and I know that it was probably very incremental that he introduced these things but even so there comes a point doesn't there you know there comes a point <laughs> no matter how you might want to experiment with your partner in bed uh, you know, some things are just beyond the pale. So yeah. I think that she was, she was that probably that one person that he could have met, who who really bought into his his thought processes, and she she maintained contact with him for a good seven years after she was <coughs> incarcerated, mm. and they wrote to each other, and they wrote to each other in in encoded terms, but they were clearly swapping sadomasochistic fantasies and harping back to experiences that they'd had together but in a coded way so she's not somebody who when she was you know separated from him suddenly went oh hang on a minute I can see I can see things clearly now I need to get away from him she she remained in that that relationship until it didn't serve her anymore to do so did she um, die in prison did she die in prison she did yes yeah, so they're yeah. both dead. Yeah, both. Yeah, both dead. I never met Myra Hindley, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm basing what I've just said mm. on having, having looked at correspondence that flowed between them, mm. but also correspondence that that they both wrote to other people. So yeah. Did you meet Sutcliffe then? Uh, briefly, briefly. Yeah. So I've not really got that much to say about him, mm. apart from my my most um, favourite 
Sutcliffe uh, anecdote, if you like, and it's not really my anecdote, but um, hmm. I suppose you're aware of Paul Harrison. No. Paul Harrison claimed to have met over 70 serial killers. Oh, my goodness. Yes. I was doing talks for this company called Funzing. And he became the top speaker across the country. He did? Okay. Yeah, and he was like, he was selling out. He must have been making like tens of thousands of pounds per like week from these talks. Wow. From all these serial killers that he knew. Yeah. Knew, knew. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, and, and I remember because he actually contacted me about, well, you know, maybe we could do something together, so to speak. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I had contact with him as well. Yeah, and, um, and he got... Very strange. I blocked him. I won't go into the reasons why I blocked him, but it was odd. It was odd, yes. And um, it turned out that he'd never met any of these people. He'd never been to work with the FBI, which actually wasn't too surprising because actually when you look at the dates of some of the people that he was meant so to he was all met, the, all, the, all the big names he was, he'd oh, met. He, he'd met John Wayne Gacy. He'd met Ted Bundy. And I was like, hang on a minute, these dates don't really add up and I actually remember saying to him when he contacted me how do you gain access to all of these people and all he would say is oh well it's not easy so he's a serial killer con artist but let me ask you this Jen. <laughs> let, me ask, let me ask you this yeah. Jen. <laughs> yeah. who do you think called him out on this hoax you no the guy on the phone earlier Robert who Nilsson close warmer warmer um, Peter Sutcliffe. Then. Yes. Oh, wow. Exactly that. Peter <sighs> Sutcliffe. And this was the most kind of... I knew that this was absolutely genuine because this is a Peter Sutcliffe thing to say, yeah? Yeah. He said, what a wazzock. <laughs> what, yeah. what a wazzock. And that's such a, that's such a Yorkshire... And I was like, yes, that... It, yeah, he said, I never met this guy. I've never met this guy. I, I realised that he's going round, you know, from theatre to theatre talking about me. I've never met him. I've never had any correspondence with him. What a wazzock. And I knew <laughs> at that point, yeah. What does wazzock even mean? Oh, what, what does Wazzock even I've never heard of it. I'm not, it's, it's, just, it's just a Yorkshire, okay. it's, just a, it's a good Yorkshire saying. Yeah. So it's along the, what the lines of, oh, what a pillock. Oh, what, pillock. Yeah. What a pillock. pillock. Yeah. What an idiot. Didn't yeah. that guy check himself into a mental place then after that? Um, I, I don't know. It turns something. out that he'd also written books. So, for example, he'd written books on things like the Loch Ness Monster and he'd claimed to have interviewed people who had been dead for several years. Because <laughs> he and was like... Also, his, Oh, everything was... He was like a big big deal, right? He, he was a big deal. And he'd faked his own death at one point, but oh, then come God's back. Sake. So I don't <laughs> know... Then come back from the dead. The, the, yeah. the tickets, the, the sales, the presentations, it was... He was like the top speaker in the country at one point. Fonzing were like promoting wow. him. Like, this is our big guy, you know? Yeah, but this is... You know, there's so many serial killer myths. And I think that his strap line was, you know, that the, the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, had said to him, you know, I'm afraid of you because you seem indifferent to me. And I remember looking at that and thinking, I can't imagine Peter Sutcliffe ever saying anything along those lines. That's just not, you know, where where did that come from? Mm. Um yeah, it, it, I, you know, I, it's so fascinating. I think we should do a programme on him. Yes. But apparently he was telling people at these talks that he and I were great, great friends and that I'd expressed a romantic interest in him. <laughs> and I was very disappointed about the fact that he was, he was, he was married. You need to interview him for your con artist show. Mm. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, he, he'd be an interesting one. Yeah. That, wouldn't that be a great podcast? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But he said, oh, I'm sorry. You know, my publishers forced me into it, which is absolute nonsense. And that um, I'm sorry, I've, you know, I've, I've got mental health problems, which oh, is, right. uh, you know, it's a good cop out, isn't it, really? So mm. who was Ian Huntley? <laughs> Ian Huntley uh, was um, the, the man who killed... Uh, Holly and Holly Jessica. and oh. Jessica, yeah. yes, uh, the Soham murder, if you want to call it that. Mm. And was um, he the caretaker? He, yes, that's yeah. right. He was a school caretaker, and he had such a history, such a dark history, of sexual assaults, domestic abuse, and just you know these these complaints had never resulted in any any prosecution. He was Mister Teflon, and also. 
the police knew that there'd been various complaints that had followed him around the country, and yet that information was never passed on to the, the school mm. before they took him on as a caretaker. And again, it, those dots were just not joined joined up. And he was one of the um, first per- people that we profiled on faking it, Tears of a Crime, because he's a great example of the the scientific model that we use to detect uh, liars, or maybe not detect liars, but to to point to things that are of of value, you know, in an investigation. Because during his his police interview, he was pulled in on on numerous occasions, but um, at this point, they'd not found the girls' bodies. And so there was no forensic evidence to, to link him. But he'd, he'd pretty much put himself in the centre of the, the whole press furore surrounding these murders. And it was actually journalists who had flagged up that the story that he was giving didn't quite make sense. He said that the girls had gone off in one direction but mm. that couldn't have been, I can't remember for what reason, but that couldn't have been, they must have gone off in another direction. So they'd flagged to the police that there was, there was an inconsistency here and also flagged to the police the fact that he seemed quite uh, willing and keen to, you know, to, to talk to cameras and, and say how he was the last one to have seen the girls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, when he was interviewed, he was... There was a moment where they basically said to him, you know, right, we need to ask you something here. So clearly giving him an indication that there's a big question coming up. And they more or less asked, you know, do you have anything to do with these girls' disappearances? And I can't remember all of it. I'd have to go back and look at it. But his body does something like nine different things, (laughs) all in the space of a few seconds. What sort of things? Well, you know, like there's a pulling back from the question. There's a a readjusting himself. And um, this is it. I'd have to go back and look at it. I'm not too sure. All I can Mm. tell you is that he does a certain number of things. A lot of fidgeting. Yeah, Yeah. lots of fidgeting. And I can't remember how he answered the question. Oh, God, this is awful. I can't remember. "Mm." I can't remember (laughs) how he answered the question, but there was something in how he answered the question. His tone was it changed. Yeah, or what we call, you know, we look for things that we call um, either hot spots or pins, which are just points of interest, things to notice. And what we look for are these points of interest that happen, at least at least three of them, over two of the body's communication channels. So that might be, you know, your physiology or your words or, you know, y- you name it, your facial expression. Eye but, movement? Sorry? Is eye movement. Thing. No, everybody thinks, oh, if you're yeah. lying, you look to one side. and you No, know, no, eye movement tends not to. Often you'll find that people will close their eyes to distance themselves from a lie or they'll try and hide their eyes. So that might be something that we look for, but this is it. We only ever look for clusters. And as I say, there are about nine things that happened. Mm. You'd have to get Cliff Lansley, who's our body language expert, to explain this to you better. Okay, that's um, part two. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but w- within a matter of a few seconds. So we're looking for at least three things that happen across two communication channels within a seven second time frame. So it's incredibly, you know, it's incredibly tight. It's, you know, it's real sort of micro things happening. Um, and he, he does them all. And it's just very interesting to, to, to look at really. And, you know, statistically he, that would, that would say that there's there's something significant going on here. And also the way that he answered the question with all of that body activity statistically would say that there was over a 90% chance that he was being deceitful. Mm. But, you know, I think you have to be careful how you interpret body language. You can get too carried away with it. But I think it was just, it's just, for me, it, it was something that showed, no, there's something interesting here that we need to persist with and we need to continue to look at him as a suspect. And then, of course, you know, eventually um, the girls' bodies were, were found and uh, their clothing was found incinerated on the, on the property of the school where he was caretaker. And then it all started to come together. Did he have an abuse backstory? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. 
So I'm sure that there will be some sort of trauma in his history because I've rarely met somebody so destructive that doesn't have trauma in their history. But how that developed into this this preference that he had for forced sex and just mm. general, you know, aggression towards females, I don't know. I've not assessed him to to, to discover that. So who was Mick Philpott? Mick Philpott was somebody who, again, we looked at on Fake and Get Tears of a Crime, who had um, killed his children in a fire. And actually, oh, he, I remember this case. Yeah, yeah. his own kids. He'd he'd set it was it was it was manslaughter rather than murder. Mm. He had a very um, strange domestic arrangement whereby he had his uh, wife and he also had a girlfriend, and yeah. Yeah, and they, they all lived together. And uh, he'd, he'd taken part, bizarrely, you know, there's always these bizarre twists. He'd taken part in some documentary with Anne Widdecombe. Yes. That was to do with men who father lots of children and have, never have, have a it? job. I, have, I didn't see the documentary, but I remember the And case. he got really aggressive no. with Anne Widdecombe at, some, at one point. Now, I don't like Anne Widdecombe. However, you know, his, his behaviour was still quite something, particularly knowing that he was being being filmed. Mm. And, you know, he was just a he was just a hideous misogynist. And his girlfriend decided that she wanted to leave him. And she did leave him and she took two of the kids with her. And it was um it was the date the date of their custody case was was coming up in in court. Uh, I think it was actually the the day before the the day after the fire, and he wanted to frame her for an arson attack so that he could get custody of the children. And I don't think that's because he particularly wanted to care for the children. I think it's because he viewed the kids as his, yes. and therefore no woman was going to take them away from him. So he set a fire in his own home. And the idea was that he was going to bravely save the children. Yes. Yeah? yeah. Pin the arson attack on her. And there you go. He's a hero. The kids are his. And he maintains this. This I think he felt that he was like a sultan, you know, in his own mm -hmm. home. This guy had never worked, never done anything of any use in his life. He just He just had... Mm -hmm you know, women, basically, that he controlled through fear and violence and, and all of these children. And uh, he managed to uh, kill all six of them. Mm. So the fire went out of control. The fire went out of control very, very quickly. All, all six children perished. Yeah. But then, bizarrely, um, he, he, he seemed quite... See, he went out. He went out to a karaoke club a couple of days later. So he obviously tried. He denied it. Um, yeah. Said obviously it was an accident, and he tried to save him. He did play the victim, didn't he? For yeah, yeah, yeah. And... He did. You know, he was he was giving he was giving appeals on on TV, etc. But then mm. going out singing at karaoke clubs and actually seemed to be celebrating the fact that he no longer had these children to care for, mm. and his um, his temporary accommodation was was booked and he had an accomplice in this fight. He actually had two accomplices. One was his wife, Maraid uh, Philpot, and one was this other guy. And there's just a really hideous part of this, um, this tape that was made by police, unbeknownst to him, where he's visited by this other guy who's like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of worried about What's, what's going to transpire here? And he wants to persuade him to keep his mouth shut. So he says to his wife, who is the mother of some of these children, don't forget, so she's just lost her children a couple of days later. Oh, right, well, you know, you can... How do I put it? You can perform a sexual service for him now, yeah, in order to, you know, as, as payment, if you like. So come on. And, and he, he actually, you know, so she performs this sexual service for this guy. And then afterwards, he says to her, well, I could see that you didn't want to do it and you didn't like to do it, but, you know, you were a good girl and hopefully that's paid him off and he'll be quiet now. So you think, what kind of shitbag are you? Yeah, you really get a flavour for who he is mm. in that 
in that moment. But they're talking about how they've they've set this fire, and of course, at that point, they're banged to rights. They don't know it, but um, mm. yeah, but they are. Did he get a good lens? Yeah, he did. I think he got a life a life sentence. So whether or not he will he will come out on parole at some point, I don't know. I don't think so. But uh, yeah, pretty pretty despicable character, really. Who was Michael Sams? Oh gosh, you know you're you're you're. I'm dr- dredging my memory banks here. Michael Sams, I can't remember who he killed, which is awful because I always try and remember the victims. I try and remember the victims' names because we rarely do that, do we? Mm. But um, he had he had killed a couple of women, and I think that one woman had been found either in the back of a van or, or, or in a box, I believe. He'd been keeping her in a box. I don't know. It was something hideous like that. And he was um, he was somebody who had a a um, a prosthetic leg, so he walked with a limp, and that was actually quite integral in him being identified eventually, and the life of this woman that he'd abducted being saved. But the reason why I'm dredging my memory banks is that just as I'd entered Wakefield Prisons, which which was you know, God, how old? Over twenty five years ago now. Um, he was on his way out of Wakefield Prison because what happened, it was, I think it was almost the day that I'd arrived, he uh, attempted to, to attack uh, a, a female probation officer who was interviewing him in a cell. And all I remember is that alarms were ringing and, you know, all the tosto- testosterone was pumping through the prison wards and they were all running and they'd, they'd, they'd jumped on him and they'd restrained him and somebody always restrains, you know, the legs. Mm. And so they were kind of like dragging him down the down the wing. And there was somebody kind of scurrying behind him. <laughs> like they didn't quite know what to do, <laughs> carrying his leg. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that's what I remember of Michael Sam. So, you know, they were, yeah, he was somebody that was, was in Wakefield Prison for probably, you know, a day, as, the same day <laughs> as I was before he was shipped out because of that. Mm. What did Colin Ireland, what crimes did he do? Colin Island was um, a man who, I think the press, you know, I hate these names that they give to them, but I think the press had called him the Gay Slayer. Gay Slayer. The Gay Slayer, yeah. Uh, because he'd killed a number of, of gay guys uh, in and around London. And they were, I mean, all murders are particularly nasty. But he'd been following the press and... Um, the press had commented on the fact that one of the victims um, had a dog. And I think that whoever had had killed him <coughs> had, had done something to make sure that the dog was found. I can't remember what it was, but it alerted somebody to the fact that this dog was, was there. And so the press had said, oh, he must be a real animal lover. Yeah, he's killing people so I'm not really sure whether that's entirely Mm. relevant but anyway the press had said he was an animal lover and he didn't want to be seen as having any kind of weakness and so um, the next guy that he killed had a pet cat so he also killed the cat and posed the body in a really very undignified way uh, you know, basically put the cat and the man in a in a sexual pose, shall we no. say? Yeah, and that was just to humiliate the victim, but also draw attention to the fact. Look, I'm not an animal lover. Don't uh, you know? When you write about me, don't don't write about me with any perceived um, compassion. But what really um, I found interesting about Colin Island was not so much him. I felt that he was somebody who definitely had sexuality issues mm. that he couldn't address and that's why he was he was killing gay men he said that he killed gay men because he wanted to kill and he felt that it was just easier to pick up gay men you know in a bar so it was easier to gain access to them but i don't i didn't buy that no. i really didn't buy that but what was interesting was the amount of fan mail that he got from people who were professed nazis or who were absolute hideous homophobes congratulating him on on what he had done and what he had achieved and i know that a lot of the you know the the gay um 
contingent of of the the prison were absolutely terrified of him. So, but how um, did he get caught? I, I'm not sure how he got caught. I can't mm. remember. I wasn't involved in the investigation. That was a bit before my time. Mm. Again, this is. I mean, he's been dead for quite a while now. This was right at the beginning of my career everybody always wants to talk to me about serial killers mm. and uh you know the most serious offenders and i can kind of get that i get the fascination because obviously i i share that fascination to to a degree that's what took me into forensic psychology but i do want to make the point that this is not what i write about because i think that what you can do is you can descend into crime porn yeah and you can, you know, people always want those lurid details, don't they? But I always think, you know, we're talking about bodies being posed with cats. That body is a person. It's somebody. And actually, I don't know that man's name, but he's got family. So I yeah. just always try and have a, have a, you know, I, I try and think about the victims. And also, I think that what we can be um, guilty of is that we... we portray this this view of crime that is you know serial killers running around all over the place now apparently there are 300 serial killers at any one time operating in the united states according to some estimates which seems way ott for me there's a lot um, in california there was a serial killer of cats when they got to arizona yeah and there were, there were cats. yeah in people's windows shooting them in people's windows there was there was quite a lot of serial killer activity yeah. over, uh, in California. In, in the UK, in they say between two and four, which is mm. either really good news or really bad news, depending on how you look mm. at it. Because I go, oh, two and four, that's good. And then you say, mm. oh, there's between two and four serial killers you know, <laughs> operating. Yeah. And people go, oh, my God, you know, that's terrifying. Yeah. But, you know, I, 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 I try to, wherever I can, talk about the people that don't make mm -hmm. the headlines. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can, we can glamorise them too much if we're mm -hmm. not careful. Definitely. We would yeah. love to get you back for a part two to talk about the people who don't make the headlines because we've run out of time. Yeah. And uh, perhaps, what, who was your, the, the body language guy? Who was? The body language guy you work with. Cliff Lansley, get him on to Cliff talk to Lansley. Perhaps four of us. Yeah, I'm sure he'd come in. Is he in, in the retreat. north or the south? He's in the north. He's in Manchester with oh, me. Oh, is he? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So for the people watching this then, is there anything you'd like to say to people in conclusion to, to watch um, where they can find you and stuff? Yes, you can find me on Twitter at Kerry Dane. So please do follow me. You'll probably get lots of photographs of my dog. But I do tweet <laughs> about crime Where's and social dog? justice. I don't know. He's, he's, he's wandered off somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and uh, if you want to read about the real life of a forensic psychologist, not what you will see in crime dramas, but nevertheless, <laughs> true to life, not crime porn, but I think nevertheless interesting, then please check out my books, The Dark Side of the Mind and What Lies Buried. Yes, all the links will be in the description box. We are part way through the audio books, absolutely gripped, but we will be continuing to get to the rest of it. And um, on socials then, can people follow you on your socials? Yeah, at Kerry Danes uh, Twitter. And I tend to do Twitter. I don't do Instagram because I've got nothing to take photographs of because mm. I don't think dog? that... Well, yeah, dog. I can yeah, I could probably... <laughs> yeah, but people want pictures of, you know, choppy Bob at, uh, you know, at Long Lart in prison, don't they? And you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. So, and I do a little bit of Facebook as well. So you can find me at Kerry Danes Psychologist on Facebook. But Twitter is the place for me to be, I think. Okay. Has Jen told you about Boomer yet? No. Oh, what about me, the, the dog? Yeah. Oh, um, my dog, I, I did mention I had a Boston Terrier. Yeah, she yeah. passed away back in April. Oh. And now Jen runs Boomer and Jen in oh, honour yes. of Boomer, uh, which is an organic cotton clothing company, and you can find Do that indeed. link in the description box as well. Thank you. <laughs> so thanks for watching, everybody. Please let us know in the comments what you thought about this. Prison fist bump. <laughs> Cheers, oh, thanks, Terry. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks brilliant. for having me. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Cheers, yeah, yeah.